welcome everybody. This is What's Up For Your Children. So um, before we start, um, just with everything that's going on out in the world, I think we'll start with really anchoring those lines within ourselves. So we'll go ahead and start breathing into the heart space first. And just nice, long, deep breaths right into the center of the heart. Again, like it's the only place where that breath can go. And then as you exhale that energy out, we're gonna exhale it out 360 degrees around us. Kind of create a nice little buffer system. Our own heart energy buffering around us. And then just for some added stability, I want you to imagine that there's a line of energy about six to eight inches above your head at your soul star. And we're gonna draw that line of energy right down through your whole body, all the way down into the earth, maybe six to eight inches into the earth. And that'll be your earth star. So from soul star to earth star, we're just gonna make sure that that line is straight. It's just completely straight. And if it's not, you can command it to straight. There we go. Oh, beautiful. All right, so now we're gonna imagine that there is from outstretched arm to outstretched arm or outstretched hand to outstretched hand, there's a line of energy that runs right across the chest, right through the heart. It intersects that line of energy that's coming down. And again, we're just gonna notice if that line is straight. This line of energy really represents your masculine and feminine, your polarities, your left and right hemisphere of the brain. <clears throat> so let's just notice if it's straight and if it's not, let's command it to straight. And then one last line here, we're gonna draw a line from out in front of us straight through the heart and out through the back of us. This line really represents, <coughs> excuse me, this line really represents our, our timeline, if you will, our past, present, future. So we'll draw that line <coughs> from out in front of us, right through the heart and back out behind us. And we're just gonna notice again, is that line straight? And if it's not, we're gonna command it to straight. There we, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Beautiful. So now let's go ahead and take a nice deep inhale into the heart again. And this time when we exhale it down, we're gonna exhale it down all of those lines of energy. 360 degrees around us. It's almost like we're gonna use those lines of energy for scaffolding or supports, structure. There we go, inhaling again right down into the heart and exhaling out 360 degrees down through those lines. And we're gonna invite our children or the children to just notice this stability within ourselves. To just notice this scaffolding, this heart-centered, buffered space that has all the structure that we could really need and that they could really benefit from. 
So one more inhale into the heart space. And we'll offer this to them as we exhale out 360 degrees. Just letting them see what we've created within ourselves. There we go. All right then, beautiful. So when you're ready, let's just open our eyes. Feels good in there, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's such a great structure to use, you know, when you're feeling a little bit discombobulated, when the energy is a little overwhelming, because you've really got all the different aspects um, of your experience kind of solidified in that structure. You've got your multidimensional self, top to bottom. You've got the masculine, feminine, you've got the polarities left to right, and you've got the timeline, the past, present, and future as it runs right through you. So when you stabilize those places, um, it's a great exercise to do before you do any work or have any interaction with an energetically sensitive kid, because they're always going to be picking up your field and if they see that that stabilizing structure is there, they're gonna feel more stable. Yeah, so, all right. So Sharon, what do we have today? Well, this question is, uh, my eight-year-old son is hitting out his brother lately. They are both nonverbal, and I'm wondering if it's anything other than civil rivalry. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I. I like, I like the, the addition to, is this just sibling rivalry? Because I think so often, especially if, if kids have, especially when kids have a diagnosis of some sort or anything like that, we have a tendency to place everything on that diagnosis instead of just seeing the natural unfolding of, you know, uh, childhood development. And, um, yeah, and in this case, um, it just feels to me like they are, there's a little bit of vying for their position in the family, vying for their, um, um, who's, um, it's, it's a little bit about um, who's the, the dominant one, who's the predominant one, who's the one that's got the attention. And so there's a little bit of energy around that. So the only thing that I would say in that case is when they're when they are arguing or fighting or beating up on each other like uh, like kids do, um, let's have them both come to you. Let's not let's not um, identify one or the other as the one that is creating the trouble. You know, one of sometimes the older one has a tendency to be the one that's called out on that kind of stuff. So let's just call them both to you so that there is, so that they can feel the, the equality of the experience. It has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, even gender. If, you know, in this case, there looks like the same gender, but even if genders are, if it's two different genders, I mean, we don't want to call that out as a separation. So let's call them both to you and let's ask them, you know, what that experience is for them. You know, just let's talk to them about that experience, not trying to fix it, just what is it for them. So, yeah, thank you. Let's see. Uh, I have a lovely young friend who had been filling with love when I first met him, but through continual uh, painful experiences being abused and in, in a difficult family environment, he is now quite tortured. He used to talk about wanting not to be here anymore and laid down on the street a number of times to try and be taken away. He no longer preserves a perservating on how he identifies with the Joker from the current movie, whom he says has a life just like him. And he says that the movie shows how he feels. I have been his refuge and calm for the past 10 years, but now that he's, young, he's a young man, I've just started wondering whether he's too far gone. He has never ever been anything but totally honest and caring with me. 
but he's okay. not, he's really focused on violence. Yeah, yeah. So well, um let let's reorganize a few things here because this idea of um, too far gone, yep, that phrase too far gone, um, sets up a, a particular energetic patterning. And regardless of whether um, this young man needs some, some psychological support or some support in other ways, we wanna make sure that, we, that what we're sending out to him right, what the energy that we're sending out is not a message of um, a lack of capacity. We wanna hold that young man in as much love and as much compassion as we possibly can. Um, the other thing that stuck out in that, and I correct me if I'm wrong here, but we wanna make sure too that when we are hearing especially when, when a child is, any youngster is wanting to express something to us, we wanna make sure that it is, um, how do I wanna say? We don't wanna, we don't wanna laugh at those things or see them as less than because from the child's perspective, whatever the lens is, is that, uh, that that individual is seeing that through, that is a real, valid, true experience for them. That's that's how, that's what's true. And so if they're honest enough and they trust us enough to come to us and say, yes, I actually do have those feelings. And yes, I actually um, do think about those things. And yes, this personality or this character does show me or reflect back to me kind of some of those feelings. We want to have, um, we want to open it up for dialogue. We don't want to shut that off in any way by either assuming that they, they're too far gone or, and or, um, you know, finding that experience in any way less than what it is for them. So, because if we can keep those lines of communication open, a lot of times the kids will start telling us exactly what they need they'll start telling us we need, I need help. I need, you know, and sometimes we'll go down a lot of different avenues in support of the children. But as long as those lines of communication are open and as long as the energy that we're projecting out to them is one of the capacity to reconfigure or reorient, they'll start telling us what they need in order for us to help them um, in the way that we can help them. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, this mom is wondering what is, why her son doesn't want to go to the bathroom by herself. By himself? Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I think it's, um, I think it's, a, let's see. Okay. Two children and they're non-verbal, let's see. Uh, it's a daughter. It's herself. Okay. okay thank you. Um, okay. So, um, um, all kinds of, there's kind of multiple layers to this. Um, so very often when there are toileting kinds of issues, again, let's, um, there can be sound sensitivities in that room. You know, bathrooms are acoustically usually uh, different than the rest of the house. So there can definitely be that part for herself, but I think it's also more of an attachment um, experience. So it feels more like when she's, the best way I can say it is that and it'll sound strange, but this is exactly what I'm hearing. As she's eliminating, as she's eliminating um, what she considers different parts of herself, she doesn't want other parts of herself, which are you all, your the family, the whatever, to not be there. She she feels that need to 
um, have that reassurance. Um, there's a little bit of acoustical things going on for her in that space, but but more often than not, it's that. So so it has to do with attachment, and so I would look down that avenue as to any kind of attachment um, issues that she might have and or that have played out in your own experience because a lot of times when we as the parents have particular attachment um, uh, challenges with attachment and or uh, challenges um, with not having attachment, I guess is the best way to say it. I would look down that road um, because that's really what it feels like the, the toileting is about in her case. So, My son will not pass cemeteries. We must circumvent always what is happening here. Um, he probably sees what's hanging out <laughs> around the cemetery um, would be my guess, but let me, um, yeah, so, I mean, we really want to understand that everything is energy and, and we, some things we see, you know, some things we're conditioned to see and some things we're just not conditioned to see. But um, you take some place like a cemetery and even if it is just a bunch of, um, people who are sad, who are burying their dead, right? Who, the people who are sad, who are going through that, that process, that energy that creates a vibrational field in that space. So it could be just picking up the sadness or the energy of what takes place, what people leave behind when they leave the cemetery. It can also be that um, there are, um, there are energies who have passed that are, um, they're connected to that location. They're connected to that space. And, um, and energetically sensitive individuals, if they don't see that, they feel it, they sense it. And sometimes they just intuitively know that's not the place for me to go, right? It's not the place for me to hang out. And so again, we want to have conversations um, with our kids about this. We don't want to laugh it off. We don't want to assume that there's nothing there. We don't want to dismiss what they're picking up because it's, uh, this is a great topic for today. It's just so important. I mean, a child doesn't come to us and say anything or express anything if it's not coming from their personal experience, right? They wouldn't, they're not just making something up. Um, they're, um, they're, and if they, if they were making something up, that's a whole different skill set. And that, that's a whole different skill set. But most children in their innocence, in their, um, I mean, I know in my own childhood, I would see things or say things or be aware of things that were very uncomfortable for the people in my environment, you know, and yet it was my experience. It was true and it was real for me. And so I would say the same thing for any experiences that your children are having, whether they're verbal, nonverbal, to be able to actually articulate to them that you that you understand that that is true and real for them. I promise they will find every way they possibly can to share with you what that is for them, right? And the beautiful part is, is we get the opportunity to learn about things that we might not have known about <clears throat> or have access to things that we didn't have access to before. So use that curiosity because man, they've got so much that they're seeing and knowing and sharing. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, uh, let's see. What the question above about the toileting issues, mm -hmm. the mother is wondering if you, uh, is it the child, the mother's attachment to the child or the mother is afraid to let her child be alone because she harms herself and 
just creates havoc. So which one is it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think those are those are the questions to ask because my guess is, is you already know the answer to that question. But um, the quest and and again, without beating up on ourselves, without making ourselves wrong or bad, or you know, um, we're all attached to different things. And of course, if you have a child who has any kinds of challenges in the world at all, we're going to have we're gonna want them to be safe, right? And especially if they're self-injurious or those kinds of things. We're, so we're not gonna beat up on ourselves for the fact that there is maybe an attachment, um, I'm gonna say experience instead of issue. There's something about saying attachment issue. It's already makes it sound like something's bad or wrong. So again, if we have an attachment experience, that is a real and valid experience either for you and or your child and it's just something to sit with and explore because what you'll notice is just when you explore that within yourself it's very likely that something can change in the energetic field and that won't be there anymore so um yeah so let and by exploring it i mean just being honest with it. You know, it's, yes, I, you know, I have this fear for my, for my child. Yes, I have. And I would, I would actually articulate that. I would say it out loud. If you don't say it out loud to your child, say it out loud to yourself, because there's something about bringing it or write it down. It's something about bringing it out into the, the physical world. It's not held as an attachment somewhere deep down inside of us, right? We just want it up and out so that we can honor it, value it, um, understand that that's what it is. And usually that in and of itself can start shifting that energy out, so. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, what, what will happen when in the, where another soul takes over his body? I share that he gets to decide and his soul, ha soul has authority over his being. He still asks this. So wondering if this could actually happen and if so, how do, how do they help him? So let me make sure I got, I have this question, right? Is it that he is concerned that other entities or whatever can take over his, his experience? Is it, is that what the, concern is uh, let's see um uh, yes he is concerned okay. with other entities okay so so first question is kind of what what is it that perpetuates that concern what is it that's you know um what is it that's bringing that about yeah so I would first, I'd want to have some connection, communication, conversation with him and ask him about where that comes from, which feels like you probably already have um, to one degree or another. And then the other question is, what does he actually fear will happen um, if that is the case? Um, those kinds of questions you're you're asking him you're asking him to fill out what his experience is so this is a real valid concern for him and you're wanting to understand the the various aspects of that concern and then once you understand those various aspects of that concern then you can um, start giving him solutions and so solutions can be, um, the truth is, is solutions can be whatever solutions you make them. You can, you can have him bubble himself up. You can have him clear his field. But more important than anything, the intention is what does it. The intention is what can alter that. But more importantly than anything, you want to make sure that it's something that he believes is 
is working. It's something that he knows when you give it to him, you're, you're going to say, so how does that feel? Does that work for you? Does that make you feel a little bit more comfortable? And if he says no, then what are we going to add to it? Or what else do we need to add? Because a, an individual who is having any experience, a child even, who's having an, any experience also has the information about how to support that experience within them. It's our job to kind of pull that information out so that they can be empowered by the experience instead of disempowered by it. Yeah. This child who seems to very distracted in the home when I am working with him, he seems to, to let's see, seems to see and talk to things I cannot see or hear, but is much more focused when out of the home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so again, we, we need to understand that all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all of our, they become things to energetically sensitive kids. So you can imagine that in the home environment, there can be the distraction of the physical reality of people in the home, but there can also be the distraction of the energetic information that those um, people who are so close to him have left in the space in the home, right? So um, easier when he's outside, out and about, both because there's a more natural element out there, but also because he doesn't have the um, intensity of connection to the people that he's walking around when he's out and about. So one of, I mean, again, one of the things that we can all do, um, we, can, we can clear our fields, right? We can clear the field of the space. It's, it's not just, um, it's not just a kind of a new age kind of thing to do. It's like, again, your intention to clean that space of anything that's in it allows, allows you to acknowledge that this population does pick up things that we don't see, you know, and so that we're just like we would create a physically clear environment for them to, you know, live in, be healthy in, we want to do that also, we could also do that on an energetic level. And that has, um, yeah, huge benefits for energetically sensitive individuals, for all of us, actually. It's nice to keep our energetic space as clear as we keep our physical space. Yeah. And I forget all the time. So if you do too, <laughs> it's like, I, I only remember it when my body starts to feel it, when I start to know I'm filled up. So I'm distracted by your beautiful face. <laughs> hey, handsome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so cute. This question is, uh, my son said that he wants to get the current vaccine. And when I explained that his body was not able to withstand the M MMR, mm -hmm. he says he's stronger now. He also shared that his father has said that I am poisoning him with my viewpoint and that I wouldn't take, let's see, I wouldn't take the risk of another vaccine. I'm, I myself am feeling scared that I may not be able to prevent him from getting this, this, any advice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's near and dear to my heart. So I get, um, yeah. Um, let me see something here. So I just want to point out something, um, hope, hopefully gently, but accurately, <laughs> uh, concisely. When somebody, when somebody says something about you, um, they're more often than not reflecting a part of themselves. It's more like a projection. So when I hear things like you're poisoning somebody with your ideas, um, I, would, I would kind of first, 
again, we, we don't want to throw that back on, on him because that's going to be uncomfortable for everybody involved. He's going to push more. But, but I, what I do want you to do is recognize that when somebody says to you something like your anything that they say to you, really, whether it's positive and or negative, it's more a reflection of their inner awareness than not. So let's be, uh, let's first maybe move into um, awareness and compassion that this father, this, uh, your child's father is assuming that there's something in them that is feeling like they are poisoning their child with their belief systems, with their ideas, right? It wouldn't come out that way, out through his verbalizations, out through his language, if it wasn't something that was kind of hidden within. Now, this individual may or may not know that that is hidden within, may not know consciously that that's part of the process. But if we can be consciously aware, we'll, we'll all kind of be consciously aware right now, just so we can add some really positive energy to this experience. So we're just going to acknowledge that somewhere within this individual, they feel like they're poisoning their child with their belief systems. Yeah. And so we're just going to acknowledge that that's there first. And when we come from that place of acknowledgement, then we can have a dialogue, right? We can have a dialogue with the child who's wanting to get the vaccine or the child who's being influenced by the parent, the other parent. We can start shifting that out because we're not making the other parent wrong, but in our awareness even, even just our awareness, something can shift, something can change. I watched this in my own, um, in my own, my ex-husband, you know, I mean, early on, um, you know, there was a real battle against vaccine stuff when I didn't want to vaccine or vaccinate the girls after I had met Riley and learned from him. And so, and I didn't understand this at the time. I didn't understand that, I mean, he was, scared to death too. He was scared to, to not do it. He was scared to do it. You know, he, he was, it was coming from this place of really just wanting to be a decent parent, wanting to be a good parent, but he didn't have the information that I had. He, he hadn't seen what I had seen. And so it, and, you know, very often, especially when you're married and, or in a divorced situation, they're not really listening to you all that often. <laughs> You know, they need their own experiences in order to come to that awareness. So the other thing I will say is that we're going to want to move this around energetically so that there doesn't have to be so much fear around it. So number one, we're going to intend that the highest and best outcome for your child, regardless of who his parents are and what their belief systems are. We're gonna, we're gonna first start there. Second, we're gonna acknowledge that, that this energy that's coming out around, um, yeah, around this fear that's actually there. We're just gonna acknowledge that it's a fear. And we're also gonna acknowledge that you know, most parents on this planet really just want to do the best for their kids, whatever that belief system is. And then third, we're going to ask that information come to him through another source so that he can make the best choice possible for all involved, not just for himself and his fears, but for all involved. So we're just going to set that energetic template right here, right now. We'll all add a little juice to it, add a little energy to it. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you, what you want to afford your son of is the ability to make a choice 
that's really in his highest and best interest. So we're, we're just, we're, we're aligning all that up energetically so that we can have that outcome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Can you give some tips on keeping our energetic space clear? I have not had success clearing my energetic space. I have had images and feelings of torture and that I was not able to clear out my field for years. I've tried everything. My intention made no difference. And the... Yep, yep. Um, so, so there's a reference point here to being, let's say, I'm gonna say it like this, like a tortured soul, right? A tortured, having a tortured experience. So the, the clearing of your space is coming out of a place of being a tortured soul, right? Of, of, and so, and that soul already doesn't believe it's, um, it's powerful enough to eliminate what's in its space because it's, it's been victimized or it's been tortured or it's been, right? So before we do any clearing whatsoever, this is a great question, before we do any clearing whatsoever, let's go back to the purity of our own being. Let's go back to the power of our own essence. And let's build that energy up a little bit. And so we, we are so conditioned as human beings to spend an awful lot of time working on the things that are wrong in our experience and trying to move those through. And that's, that's great. However, we, we have to and want to spend equal time building up that part of ourselves that is already whole, that's already total. That, that energetic exercise we did at the beginning, that sphere <clears throat> with that scaffolding in it, that's also a great way to kind of come back to center to really feel the vastness of your own being first and then clear the space from there, right? It's just, yeah, it's like, it's like clearing the space from love versus clearing the space from fear. And for somebody, you know, who's had, um, if you've had a lot of experience with and challenges in life that have created a lot of fear or, um, or that energy of, you know, being done to victimized by the outer world. Nobody has taught us that the that that essence still exists within us. Nobody has. They might have said it, but nobody really um, showed us how to harness that energy. So we want to go back into the purity of our own being. We want to. I mean, I would spend moments there on any given day, you can stand in line at the grocery store and, and tap into the essence or the purity of your own being. You know, you can start strengthening that field because it's just, it's just not had as much um, attention time, let's say, as maybe some of the fear parts. So we're just gonna build that field first. And then honestly, you probably, if you build the field field first, there's probably going to be very little clearing that's going to be needed to be done over the long haul because your own field will purify that space. Yeah, your own presence will purify that space. But in the meantime, we can do a little bit of a combination of both where we build that up and then we, we try it out in the field and make sure that once you've cleared something, that you actually go back to your the purity of your own being, the essence of your own being, and just see how that feels. Yeah, it's like again, um, we we want to check we want to check these things. How does it actually feel? What I just did, because that's going to give you the um, that that's gonna that's gonna uh, make it real. Yeah, it's gonna validate what you've done. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful. I was thinking about this quite a bit. So I'm going to add this to this call today before we close out. Um, I've just been having, I've been having um, different experiences around 
the just how real energy is. We've been kind of talking about that here today. Um, and just how much we are moving as a humanity from a more cognitively based awareness to a more intuitively based awareness. And so, and in that transition from, you know, cognitively based, think with the head, right? Everything's about cognitive information. We're moving down into that heart space and even down lower in the body now into a more intuitively based, sensory based awareness. So doesn't it make sense that we have all of these kids now who are so sensory aware, you know, they're so sensory heightened. They're, they're kind of teaching us that that energy is first, you know, and the physical part is second. What something feels like is more important than what it looks like, right? And, and, and how we feel in a space is more important than what the space looks like, yeah? And so we just really want, we're starting to, um, we're starting to move We've had this awareness. We know that things, we know, again, we know that things are energy first and that, you know, we're spiritual beings having a human experience and all that other kind of good stuff. But now's the time to really put this into practical application. And one of the ways to put that into practical application is to, to pay attention to some of the nuances that are going on within us. And instead of dismissing those nuances, let's just let's just sit with them for a little bit. Like like this morning, I woke up and you know there was there was anxiety. Like first thing in the morning, I've been having it you know pretty regularly with all the stuff that's going on. So that anxiety comes up first thing in the morning. My heart's all contracted and my throat. You heard it, it was still working itself out as we were talking. So so again, I can. I can feel that compression in my heart and I can just dismiss it and try to go do other things and not think about it. Or I can turn my awareness back into that heart space and let the energy of that heart space start, start talking to me. Or if it's not talking, if I'm not hearing anything, just being with it, just acknowledging that it's a real and valid experience. I might not know what it's about, but I do know that my body knows what it's about because my body has brought it to the forefront. So again, can we, can we be kind and loving and appreciative of those places instead of just trying to walk over them and get into something else, right? So it does require us slowing down, yeah? And I know from my, from my own perspective, I know that I heard years ago, Susie, you need to slow down a little bit. You know, you need to slow down. And, and I kind of, no, I gotta go, I gotta go, right? And then I kept going. And then all of a sudden the body goes, you need to slow down a little bit. And it wasn't, it wasn't um, that I needed to slow down because something was quote unquote wrong necessarily. I needed to slow down in order to receive the information so that I could move forward. Yeah, it wasn't, a lot of times we just don't want to slow down and pay attention to these places and spaces within ourselves or these emotions or these feelings because we don't want to get hooked in by them, right? We don't want to get dragged back to them. We're afraid they're going to take us over or something or we're afraid there's something wrong, you know, <laughs> and that we're, then we'll have to address one more thing. But, but part of the reason why anything feels like it's off or wrong energetically is because it just hasn't been met. It just hasn't yet been addressed. And if we'll do that, if we'll address it, if we'll be with it, be present with it, just like we were talking about being present with our kids when they're having whatever experience they're having, what you're gonna notice is you're gonna naturally start to purify and clarify your own field that has a huge benefit to your children who are so energetically sensitive. So it's worth it to take a few moments to kind of go, what is this? You know, it's like, I wonder what this is about. Ooh, it feels like this. And it kind of gives me this kind of 
you know, vibe and, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, oh, I'm even getting a little nervous or a little afraid. But what you're teaching yourself is you can be with all of that. You can be present to all of that. What a great thing to teach an energetically sensitive child. There's all kinds of things moving and shaking and going on out there, but you're capable of being present with all of it. You're capable of, of meeting all of it. That's what we're trying to teach them as we meet these different places within ourselves. So that's what we are teaching them. So anyway, um, I just wanted to add that to the mix because it's been coming around quite a bit lately. So anyway, thank you so much for being here, everybody. Lots of love and um, I'll see you when I see you. Bye.